Continuing from where we left off at the end of this morning's session, we are concerned with the third of the four dharmas of Lord Gampopa, which he phrased, grant your blessings so that for myself and all beings, the path dispel bewilderment. The function of the path is to dispel bewilderment. The means by which bewilderment is dispelled are the various practices of the Hinayana, Mahayana, and Vajrayana. Within the Vajrayana in particular, these means or methods are two. The generation stage, through which bewilderment is dispelled, and the completion stage, through which bewilderment is dispelled. This morning, I briefly went over the generation stage, and now I'm going to begin to talk about the completion stage. First of all, the result of generation stage practice is, at best, that the practitioner sees the yidam face to face, or, if not that, at least gains stability in the generation stage samadhi, or, if not that, at least generates some degree of clarity and develops extraordinary faith uh, in their yidam. As a result of this, their kleshas will be somewhat pacified, and the qualities of samadhi in general uh, will increase. Now, when we come to the practice of the completion stage, there are two aspects to it. One is the completion stage in connection with the generation stage, and the other is the completion stage unconnected with the generation stage. The completion stage that is connected with the generation stage refers to the practice of the completion stage that occurs at the culmination of any session of generation stage practice. One first meditates upon the mandala of deities and then dissolving it into emptiness cultivates the practice of resting without uh, elaboration in dharmata. Now we practice this, but we do not regard this as the principle or main practice of the completion stage per se. The principle or actual completion stage practice is that which is unconnected with the generation stage. This also has two aspects, the path of means and the path of liberation. The path of means refers to practices such as the six dharmas of Naropa, where, after mastering the generation stage practice and in strict retreat, one meditates on the channels, winds, and drops. The other aspect of the completion stage, unconnected with the generation stage, is the path of liberation, which is Mahamudra. And it is about this in particular that I wish to give you a brief explanation. Now, in presenting Mahamudra, Lord Gampopa taught it in several ways. He taught the Mahamudra of Sutra, the Mahamudra which integrates Sutra and Tantra, and so forth. In any case, fundamentally, Mahamudra is a way of realizing Dharmata through the practice of meditation. In understanding it, we can divide Mahamudra into three, view, meditation, and conduct, or into four, view, meditation, conduct, and fruition. In either case, the view comes first. Now, this term view can refer to two different things, one of which is the view which is taking inferential valid cognition as the path. This is the view that is generated through rigorous analysis, where, through analysis, one develops a conceptual certainty about the nature of things. One then attempts to gradually refine this conceptual certainty through the practice of meditation. This is using that conceptual certainty gained through inferential reasoning as the starting point of the path and is therefore called taking inferential valid cognition as the path. The other approach to the view is called taking direct valid cognition as the path and this starts with the direct identification of the nature itself. Ini tadi yang jipolam tu sih betawa. 
The approach which takes inferential valid cognition as the path is principally set forth in the great treatises of the Middle Way School. And fundamentally, it starts with proving through logical analysis that all things are empty. There are many uh, arguments or reasonings set forth to, make, to prove this, such as the analysis of causes, analysis of results, and so on. But perhaps the easiest to understand and simplest to explain is the one that is called the reasoning of one and many, that is, analysis of the nature. And this is found very commonly presented in most or all of the Middle Way School treatises. Essentially, in looking at the idea of one and many, you start by looking at one, and by establishing that there is no such thing as one, no such thing as a true unit, you determine that there is also no such thing as many. Now, the things you can analyze in this way are many. You can analyze all of the phenomena that we experience, those we regard as pleasant, those we regard as unpleasant. And by selecting any one phenomenon from among these, you, you determine that it is empty. It is empty because it is not a truly existent unit. We mistake things as true units through bewilderment, and therefore we also come to mistake them as pleasant or unpleasant. Whether you are talking about an external phenomenon an object of appearance, or a mental phenomenon, a mental state, its nature is emptiness. So the starting point of demonstrating this is determining that a thing that we normally regard as or think of as a unit is not truly unitary. For example, consider hand. We use the term hand and the concept hand all the time, and we know what we mean by it. We use it in specific cases, my hand, her hand, my left hand, my right hand, and so on. We know, all, we know this and we know what we mean by it, and in using this term and in using this concept, which is very convenient, we entertain the assumption that we are talking about one thing, something that is truly unitary. Yet at the same time, we know perfectly well that a hand has parts. A hand has a thumb, a forefinger, a middle finger, ring finger, little finger. More than that, it has skin, muscles, bones, and nerves. A hand is not a unit. Hand is a mere convention. It is a concept used to designate an isolated aggregate of phenomena. Even if we take merely a part of the hand, for example, one finger, and subject it to the same type of analysis, we must come to the same conclusion that it is an aggregate and not a unit. In that way, whatever part of one's body one selects, one's right hand, left hand, foot, head, it doesn't matter, you determine that it is the appearance of a unit that does not truly exist. Now, in the sense that the units that seem to appear to us as units do not truly exist as units, they are no more real than the appearances within a dream. In a dream, we may see a house, and we know, after waking up, that although that house did appear to us, it was not there. It was the appearance of something that did not exist. In the same way, the appearances of the waking state are the appearances of things, units, for example, that do not exist. Now, the conclusion one comes to in this regard is essentially the same as what scientific analysis would lead to. In either case, in breaking things down through analysis, we eventually come to some kind of small particle. If we propose that this small particle is a true and indivisible unit and therefore does not have parts, we must question that. Because does this particle face simultaneously different directions? For example, is, is the particle on one side facing east and on the other side facing west? If it is, then it has parts. 
because it has faces it can be, that can be distinguished from one another. This is how, using the reasoning of one and many, we analyze external phenomena. You can also apply it to internal phenomena, such as states of, of cognition. Cognitive phenomena, such as the experience of past, present, and future, do not withstand analysis, and consciousness itself does not withstand analysis, because it can be proven that a given consciousness only arises in relation to its object. And if that object has no true existence, then there is no reason to, to propose that the consciousness does. For example, an eye consciousness can only arise in the presence of form, an ear consciousness in the presence of sound, and so on. Through this and similar analyses, you can generate conceptual certainty about the nature of things. But, and although this conceptual certainty can be true certainty, when you attempt to employ this in meditation, it is difficult. Because after all, you can't meditate by trying to maintain a thought, such as things are all empty or partless particles do not truly exist. This is inconvenient. Therefore, the application of the conceptual certainty gained through inferential valid cognition in meditation requires considerable support. The necessary support, in this case, is an accumulation of a vast amount of merit. And this is why the path that is based upon the use of inferential valid cognition takes so long, because to accumulate the necessary amount of merit, it takes three periods of innumerable aeons. The other approach to the view is that of the Vajrayana, in which case the view is gained not through inferential valid cognition, but through direct valid cognition. Now the view, in a sense, is the same. It is how the view is gained that is different. In the Vajrayana tradition, we accept that external phenomena are empty, but we leave them alone, because whether external phenomena are empty or not, they are not the problem. It is our mind which wanders through samsara, and it is our mind that will achieve liberation. So therefore, we concern ourselves with the mind directly. As well, the mind, the nature of the mind can be seen directly, unlike the nature of external phenomena. Now, the sources of the tradition which takes inferential valid cognition as the path are the writings of Arya Nagarjuna and Arya Deva, as well as those of Chandrakirti and so forth. In these, this process is demonstrated, and also in the writings of Lord Maitreya, such as the Uttara Tantra Shastra. And from these various writings have arisen the empty of self tradition, the empty of other tradition, and so forth. The sources of the tradition of taking direct valid cognition as the path are the writings of the Siddhas, such as Lord Saraha, who, for example, in one of his songs said, while herding buffalo, I looked at the nature of my mind. In short, this process is based upon a very direct and simple approach, possibly involving a very simple lifestyle as well. Because it is based upon direct experience, it is very quick. Now we find different statements about how long it takes to achieve awakening. In the sutras, it is said that it takes three periods of innumerable aeons to achieve Buddhahood. In the Vajrayana, we find the statement that that same Buddhahood can be achieved in one life and one body. If we look at those statements, initially we would assume that one of them must be incorrect, but in fact they're both true. The reason why the path of the sutras does indeed require three periods of innumerable aeons is that the path which takes inferential valid cognition as its basis requires a vast accumulation of merit, which it takes that long to achieve. Whereas the path based on direct valid cognition is based upon direct experience, and therefore that same awakening, the state of unity, Vajradhara, can indeed be achieved in one life and one body. So these are the two ways that the view can be established, through inferential valid cognition and through direct valid cognition. And in practice, 
we rely upon the view gained through direct valid cognition. Tini tati cherna jitan malari pi ji gombo pa ta gombo dar jitra wala pip kapsu kong dongwa na kapsu. About the ascertainment of the view through direct valid cognition, before his departure to uh, the Dalagombo mountain, uh, Gampopo received from Milarepa the following instruction in a song. Lord Milarepa sang, since it is definitely the view, look at your own mind. So we gain the view through looking at our minds. How do you do this? Elsewhere in a song of Lord Melarapas, we find the statement, appearance, emptiness, and their inseparability. These three are a summary of the view. The mind has an aspect of appearance, experience, and so forth, and it has an aspect of emptiness. But in spite of what we might think, the appearance aspect of the mind in, is in no way negated or interfered with by the emptiness aspect. The appearance aspect does not cease as a result of the emptiness aspect. And the emptiness aspect does not mean that the mind is nothingness. Appearance does not mean substantial existence or true existence. And emptiness does not mean nothingness. The appearance of the mind is nothing other than its emptiness, and the mind's emptiness is not outside or apart from its mere appearance. These two are indivisible or inseparable, and this is what is meant by appearance, emptiness, and their inseparability. Now, nowadays, many teachers point this out directly. And in giving this kind of pointing out instruction or introduction, disciples have some kind of experience on the spot. That experience is that they're actually seeing some aspect of the nature of mind, some aspect of dharmata. Now at one time, I believed that what they were having was actually a glimpse of the wisdom of the path of seeing. And there is some literary support for this. For example, in the writings of Azam Drupa, a great teacher of the great perfection tradition, he declares that what is experienced by a disciple when receiving an authentic introduction is a glimpse of the wisdom of the path of seeing. But I feel that really what the disciple experiences at that time is not the actual wisdom of the path of seeing. Because what is being pointed out is the view. And whether the view is gained through inferential reasoning or direct valid cognition, direct experience, the view itself is nothing more than the ascertainment of the path. There is a difference between the ascertainment of the path, where you need to go, and actually going there. And you can only actually go there through the practice of meditation. For example, if I were to ask somebody, how do I get to New York City? They could indicate the road to me, and I would understand that. But nevertheless, to actually get to New York, I would have to travel on that road. Therefore, Milarepa continues in his song and says, clarity, non-conceptuality, and absence of distraction, these three are a summary of meditation. In meditating, we experience the mind's innate clarity or cognitive lucidity. But in this experience, we need to remain free of conceptualization of it or fixation on it. And furthermore, we need to be able to rest without distraction in this experience, which is to say to nourish or continue this experience in both, in both meditation and post-meditation. In that way, we gain experience of meditation. Tini Tati Tabu Gumbala Tatu Kari Gugi or is in a tangbo Hini Jiting and Zen Yabuji Gugi or La Tini Hini Jiting and Zen Gubatia Tatanda J. Semj Nilu Nyung Yamunji Yurna Ya Tila Tencha. The principal thing that is necessary for proper meditation to arise is an authentic samadhi of tranquility. 
In, in the case where someone has somehow gained experience of their mind's nature, but uh, has not cultivated tranquility and therefore has not achieved any stability of mind, this experience is going to remain ephemeral and fleeting. It will be very hard for them to either prolong or intensify this experience of recognition. On the other hand, if someone has cultivated the stable practice of tranquility meditation, they will have no difficulty in increasing uh, any uh, burgeoning recognition of their mind's nature. As for how tranquility meditation is taught, in the great texts of instruction, many different techniques and categories of techniques are presented. Tranquility relying upon a support, tranquility without support, and so on. Using these techniques is very good. As for the nature of tranquility, it's explained in a stanza composed by the third Jawan Kamapa, Rangjun Doje, who wrote, the waves of coarse and subtle thoughts uh, pacified or subsiding into their own place, the river of mind abiding uh, naturally without movement, free of the, uh, the pollution of torpor and dullness, may my mind achieve uh, an unmoving ocean of tranquility. Essentially, in this stanza, he describes three characteristics of the state of tranquility using various images. The first characteristic is the pacification of thought. In the unpacified or untranquil state, our minds are like bodies of water that are turbulent with lots of waves. The waves in this case are the thoughts which arise in our minds. Some of these thoughts are subtle, some of them are coarse, but in either case, these thoughts prevent our minds from coming to rest. If you relax your mind, then these thoughts, both the coarse and the subtle ones, will settle down, will subside or be pacified. And they are pacified in their own place, which is to say, they subside back into the mind from which they emerge. You do not have to attempt to cast these thoughts out of your mind. That pacification of thought is the first characteristic of tranquility. The second is that the mind abides in a state of peace. And this is described in the next line, which says, the river of mind abiding naturally without movement. This refers to the state of clarity in which arises within the mind that is undiminished and yet still. The absence of thoughts, the thoughts having been pacified, does not mean that the mind's awareness or clarity is somehow diminished. The clarity remains undiminished, but the mind is at peace. So the second characteristic is the mind abiding in a state of peace or stillness. Now we might think that this is enough, that the pacification of thought and the ensuing stillness are sufficient to achieve a state of tranquility. But in fact, they are not. In the case of the water, which we use here as an analogy, although water may be still, it can still be full of lots of silt and stones and mud and all sorts of things. In which case, although the water is still, it is not clear. So the mind needs not only to abide in stillness, but in a stillness that is free of the defects of torpor and dullness. Therefore, in the next line, we find free of the stains, which are the pollution of torpor and dullness. And finally, may the mind abide stably without movement in the ocean of tranquility. So in order to achieve this state of tranquility endowed with the three characteristics of the pacification of thought, the abiding in stillness, and the undiminished clarity of mind free of torpor and dullness, we can rely upon any number of tranquility techniques, such as the tranquility with support and tranquility without support techniques I mentioned earlier, or as many teachers recommend nowadays, simply the tranquility based on following the breath. In either case, it is important, regardless of technique, that the state of tranquility achieved 
be both stable and lucid. Although lucidity is very much part of authentic tranquility, this lucidity is not the lucidity of insight because insight or lokdong is only present when there is the view, in this case, the recognition of the mind's nature. So a state of tranquil lucidity without this recognition of the mind's nature, without this view, is still merely tranquility. If the tranquil lucidity incorporates a recognition of the mind's nature, then it is a tranquility that incorporates insight. <laughs> Well, that was about tranquility meditation. I, w I was thinking that I would present the insight meditation as well as the fourth Dharma, bewilderment arising as wisdom, together tomorrow morning. So I'm going to conclude with that for this afternoon. And if anyone has any uh, doubts or questions, we have time for one or two. Thank you. Uh, Rinpoche, this morning you spoke about the Dharma Palas. And although every day for many, many years now I've been including the Dharma Palas in my chants, I realize I really don't know very much about them or how to use them as a support for my practice. I wondered if you might say a little bit more about the Dharma Palace for us. Thank you. The nature of Dharmapalas uh, is that they are an aspect of the Sangha. Generally speaking, when we think of the three jewels in the common context, we go for refuge to the Arya Sangha as companions on the path which means that the function for us of the Sangha is when we mistake the nature of the path or become diverted from the path or discouraged on the path, they dispel whatever obstacles or impediments are bringing this about. They inspire diligence, they help us generate faith and devotion and encourage us in all sorts of ways. For example, we experience this such as when you practice in the midst of an assembly of the Sangha, somehow you are inspired and encouraged by the presence of others. Now when we talk about the Sangha in the common or general context, we seem to be talking about human beings. But when we are more specific and talk about that aspect of the Sangha that are called Dharmapalas, we are definitely talking about non-human beings. Some of these are wisdom dharmapalas, that is to say, Buddhas who appear in the form of a dharmapala. Some of them are bodhisattvas who appear in the form of a dharmapala. But in any case, these are beings that are conventionally invisible to us, that we can't encounter the way we encounter other human beings. Nevertheless, they can and do dispel our obstacles. Now, the wisdom dharmapalas, being what they are, naturally have impartial compassion for all beings. However, in order to dispel obstacles for a being, that being has to form a connection with them. And we attempt to form that connection with the dharmapalas through supplication of them. As for how we meditate upon them, from among the two main ways of visualizing deities, self-generation and front-generation, we principally or primarily 
visualize the Dharmapalas in front of us. And then visualizing them, we uh, make offerings to them and so on. For example, in praising the Dharmapalas, we say of them, I pay homage to and praise those Dharmapalas who in the presence of the Bhagavad promise to protect practitioners of his Dharma like their own children. So in that way, we remind them of their promise, we offer them our practice itself and other offerings as well, we entrust our welfare and the activity ensuring our welfare to their care, we pray that they remove obstacles and establish conducive conditions and so on. That is how one practices Dharmapalas. Thank you, Rupeshe, um, for your teachings. Um, you said, without the view, um, which is, uh, I don't know exactly if I got what you said exactly. Um, you were talking about achieving tranquility through various ways, pacifying uh, thoughts in their own place and um, clarity and stillness. And then you said that um, the state of tranquility uh, was not stable without Let me ask the you view. if you're referring to this thing this, and then what if you, you just are, said. then I'll ask him about it. Okay. The statement that although the ideal state of tranquility must include lucidity, that lucidity is not the lucidity of insight, if the view, which is the direct recognition of the mind's nature, is not present, it's still tranquility. Is that what you're referring That's to? That's it. That's it. <laughs> Do you want to ask him what that means? Yes, I would okay. like to. Um, I would like to hear more about how the view okay. is uh, incorporates <laughs> insight. Okay. <laughs> 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 You <laughs> Come out on Bandabuman, Basabu, Mone, Nanto Mantua, September, Salvatina, Sigi Orella, then in Hontong Salwa, Sinki, the Jerdo, Sani, Jujurete, Yinaya, Tatanda, Semge, Nelu, Mohi Basinki, Sem de la Tene, Ripi, Toti, Chepa, Maipa, Sem Jingo de la Teca, Tena. Tini senti sacha dananto. Nupo dendito. Yana yepta kadu yerna, yepta kadu dendito. Yana yepta kadu menaya, yep your mari kadu your mari to korang upo denditi yore sene. Tini uzu, nea no yore visena. Tini nea andu tena, nea your mari la. Nea mepa de candidacy and naranke sol mahi. Narang Tol Matu Narang Tamahini, De Juan Revisina Mari Korang Mo de Rangi Tomba in Palatene Tene Tanda Tene T Naranzo Mus Tau Capsula Yomarela T Mepatilla Korang Mo Rangi Tomba Tomba Segi or the Tomba Re Tomba Te Candidates and Tomba Te Pemton Chiamepa
The lucidity of tranquility is distinct from the lucidity of insight in that the lucidity of tranquility is merely the, cont the uh, undiminished continuity of the mind's innate lucidity. That is to say that in the state of tranquility, although your mind is stable and is not producing thoughts, it is also not unconscious or asleep. The mind remains conscious, that is to say its cognitive lucidity remains functioning or undiminished. This is different from the recognition uh, which characterizes insight. Now, I'll go into this in more detail tomorrow, but to explain it briefly, insight is when the mind recognizes its own nature, not in the manner of uh, analysis, but in the manner of a direct observation. When a mind looks at itself, it can see its own nature. This is something that the mind can experience, but it is not the experience or finding of any substantial thing or characteristic. When the mind searches within itself for characteristics, looks for color, shape, size, location, and so on, it finds none of these things. Now the reason why you don't find any such substantial characteristics when you look at your mind is not because you're not looking properly or not looking hard enough. It's because these things are simply not there. And it is because the mind is free of or without such substantial characteristics that we say that the nature of the mind is emptiness. But emptiness does not mean absolute nothingness, dead emptiness. Because the mind, while being utterly empty, still experiences, still knows, is still cognitive. But that experience in cognition is empty of true existence or substantial existence. The recognition of this indirect experience is what is called the recognition uh, of insight. And if you practice meditation on this, uh, you will gain it. Thank you very much. <laughs> So the following question will be the last one. <laughs> Rinpoche, just very quickly, um, I've never heard before the four dharmas of Gampopa translated the way Lama Yeshe is with um, Myself and all saying? sentient beings. Oh, that, that's it. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. And I'm wondering if I can yeah. request Rinpoche's permission to use it that way in oh. our Dharma group. Okay. Because I think it's beautiful. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but it's not, but it wasn't, the, it's not a translation issue, the two forms, the one where that's added and one where that's not, that's why it's not. Is it possible to get a actual translation of it in the way that you've been doing it? Because... <laughs> The only difference is that at the beginning of the four it says, um, well, the order in the Tibetan is the opposite, but it says, uh, of myself and all sentient beings, and then they, they follow. So I can just stick that in there. Tijana, take it. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.